Centuries of Oppression, The Road to 1918. Chapter 18, The Speaker's Conference and the Approach to 1918. Why was universal male suffrage and the vote for the majority of women achieved in 1918, with World War I still in progress? Remarkably, this question is rarely given a clear answer, not at least an answer which bears scrutiny. This has not prevented sources on the internet making authoritative sounding statements on the matter. Some may point lamely to women's war work, but this falls flat even as an explanation for women's success. More seriously, I hope it is clear by now that it was working class enfranchisement which was the real problem, not votes for women per se. So any answer to the question must address first and foremost how the reluctance to enfranchise working class men came about. Expressed in this manner, the relevance of the war becomes starkly obvious. But let us examine the details. Make no mistake, the 1918 Act was a radical break from the past, hugely changing the extent of enfranchisement for both men and women. It brought about changes more comprehensive and far-reaching than any kindred act in English history, to quote the American Political Science Review of 1918. This is not mere hyperbole. No previous act had enfranchised more than two million people. The 1918 Act would enfranchise 14 million. To pass such a momentous bill, both Houses of Parliament must have had an equally momentous reason. The reason breaks down into two parts. The reason why it was necessary to re-examine the basis of the franchise at all and the reason why it took the form that it did. The first of these is easy and provides a link with the war, which is beyond any doubt. The electoral roll had been shot to pieces by the war. Millions of men were away at war and not able to vote. Meanwhile, back at home, the mobilisation of the entire country on a war footing had led to wholesale displacements of people from their hometowns and counties. There could be no general election while the war persisted, but the ground needed to be prepared to permit an election as soon as possible thereafter. Exactly who could vote and where needed to be sorted out. This was why the government was obliged to take on such a major overhaul of the political system when they had more than enough on their plates with World War I. The need was urgent and imperative, else it would not have been contemplated. This is the first and indubitable link between the act and the war. According to a near contemporaneous review in the American Political Science Review, 1918, it was not by choice that the ministry and the two houses turned their attention to the electoral question while the nation was yet fighting for its life, the sound of gunfire within hearing of the channel ports. Rather, they were compelled to do so by the sheer breakdown of the electoral system, caused by wholesale enlistments in the army and by the further dislocation of population incident to the development of war industries. The situation was bad enough in county, municipal and parish elections, but a parliamentary election under the new conditions would have been a bold anomaly. It should not be forgotten that by the time the 1918 Act was passed, there had been more than seven years since the last general election. The reader will note that this exceeds the maximum term of a British elected government, which is five years. There would not be a general election until the war ended, though they were quick about it when it did. The war ended on the 11th of November 1918 and the election was held on the 14th of December 1918, 
the government being by then of eight years duration. It is not hard to understand why Parliament and all due process agreed to these extraordinary arrangements. With millions of men away at war, a general election would have been insupportably undemocratic. Similar arrangements were in force during the Second World War, that government enjoying ten years in office. The same American Political Science Review cited above opined, writing before an election was ultimately held, by general consent the life of the Parliament chosen in December 1910 has been prolonged in order to defer and perhaps to avoid altogether a wartime election. A general election, however, there must eventually be, and whether before or after the cessation of hostilities, it would demand, in all justice, a radically altered system of registration and voting, if not new franchises and other important changes. With these points in mind, why did the 1918 Act succeed in enfranchising both women and working men when so many early attempts to do so had failed, not least as recently as 1910, 1911, 1912 and 1913. You would have to be willfully blind not to admit the war must be at least part of the reason. To address the problem of how the franchise was to be resurrected, the government appointed a committee chaired by the Speaker of the House of Commons, called the Speaker's Conference. The membership was MPs and peers. Apart from the chairman, there were 34 other members of the conference, 13 Conservative, 13 Liberal, 4 Irish Home Rulers and 4 representing the Labour Party. It began work in October 1916 meeting 26 times and produced a comprehensive set of proposals by January 1917. I quote again from the near contemporaneous American Political Science Review of August 1918. Parliament acted wisely in entrusting the preliminary consideration of a new electoral law to an extraordinary commission chosen by the Speaker of the House of Commons and presided over by him, and constituted with much care to represent in proper proportion not only the parties and groups in Parliament, but the various bodies of public opinion on electoral questions throughout the United Kingdom. The Speaker, James Lowther, was an anti-suffragist. The 34 members of the conference were chosen to be 17 pro-suffragist and 17 against. However, when three anti-suffragist members resigned, perhaps sensing the way things were going, the Speaker, despite his own opinions and to his credit, appointed three pro-suffragist members. The conference thus gained a majority in favour of franchise extension. The report produced by this Speaker's Conference led directly to the drafting of the Bill, which would ultimately become the 1918 Act. The recommendations of the Speaker's Conference were largely adopted in the final Act. The parliamentary debates changed only some relatively minor details. The extraordinarily egalitarian recommendations of the Conference are summarised by the American Political Science Review as follows. The effort to adapt electoral machinery to the conditions entailed by the war early convinced the Speaker's Conference that the old practice of defining franchises in terms of relationship to property would have to be discontinued, and that in lieu thereof it would be necessary to adopt the principle that suffrage is a personal right inherent in the individual. In pursuance of this revolutionary decision, the Act swept away the entire mass of existing intricate parliamentary franchises and extended the suffrage to all male subjects of the British Crown 21 years of age or over and resident for six months in premises in a constituency 
without regard to value or kind. This extraordinarily egalitarian democratic spirit would appear miraculous were it not for the years of campaigning by both women's groups and men's groups in their disparate ways. The Speaker's Conference addressed the male franchise first. The principle of basing the franchise on the democratic basis of a personal right was established in this context. Only then was the issue of women's suffrage addressed. The door was now open. They voted 15 to 6 in favour of making some sort of concession. In fact, the conference only very narrowly rejected by 12 to 10 an equal franchise with men. They explicitly did so in order to avoid creating a female majority. Instead, they recommended an age restriction of either 30 or 35. In the final act, the age limit of 30 was adopted. This age restriction will be discussed further shortly, but note that without it following World War I, women would have entered the electorate for the first time with an immediate majority of 2 million. As it was, in 1918, they became 43% of the electorate. The bill passed its second reading in the Commons on the 23rd of May 1917 by 329 votes to 40. On a free vote on the 19th of June 1917, the Commons approved the Women's Clause by 387 to 57. It was subsequently passed by the House of Lords, which had previously been opposed to franchise increases by 134 to 71. It is generally held that the Lords' change of heart was due to a reluctance to have a showdown with the Commons, but it re is reasonable to suppose that the conditions of war played a role in their thinking as well. <laughs>